Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2 triumphs by kicking its hero's ass. Tobey Maguire takes such a beating in this film that you just want to scream in frustration with everyone else. No! Ben, where's my money? Avenge me! No! No! And that frustration is exactly what makes Spider-Man 2 my favorite Spidey film. A movie that, like The Dark Knight, inspired younger me to spend my adulthood obsessively re-watching superhero movies. Which is why I was stoked a month ago when you guys voted these movies your top request to re-explore. So let's dive back into Spider-Man 2, scene by scene, hell, frame by frame! For all the easter eggs, cameos, and subtle filmmaking details that you might have missed. And it's okay, I missed some of these at first too. Here we go. The opening titles feature comic book imagery recapping the first film with the artwork by the great Alex Ross. Some of Ross's Spider-Man comic art makes subtle cameos later. The police photos and Harry Osborn's research on Spider-Man. And we transition from Ross's brushstrokes of MJ's eyes to what we think is her face, but what is actually a misdirect perfume billboard taunting Peter Parker with unattainable love. This face bookends the film as its closing shot. The woman Peter must turn his back to in order to be the hero, the responsibility of his great power. Another visual example of Peter's back turned to MJ, the flower stand where he later buys flowers for MJ is behind him here next door to his new job at Joe's Pizza. Pizza time! Comedian Asif Bonvi plays Mr. Aziz. Cool! If you actually watch this movie slowly, you can barely see how they snuck in another haunting MJ perfume ad on the bus Peter nearly hits. He cannot escape her. Chappelle Show comedian Donnell Rawlings shows up. Whoa! He stole that guy's pizza! And the guy who steals a slice of not deep dish pizza is Scott Spiegel, co-writer of Evil Dead 2 with Sam Raimi. He shows up in the jazz club in the next movie. Scott, I'm sorry you had to be there for that. And despite Peter's charming greeting, Pizza time. Future Bone star Emily Deschanel holds him to the 29 minute guarantee. Oh. Now the phone number on his helmet sticker is the real phone number for Joe's Pizza in New York. And yes, the address on Bleecker Street is nearby 177A Bleecker Street, the Sanctum Sanctorum residence of Doctor Strange, whom according to J. Jonah Jameson exists in this movie's universe. Doctor Strange, that's pretty good, but it's taken. Peter gets back to back sacks. You're fired. Parker, hello, you're fired. Yeah, Peter cannot catch a break in this film. And I cannot think of a superhero movie that so tortures its hero with failure after failure in all kinds of little ways. Now, sure, in Infinity War, they lose half of everyone. In A Dark Knight, he loses Rachel. But those losses are balanced out by sexy wins throughout the rest of those movies. There's nothing sexy about Spider-Man 2. This guy's broke, humiliated, impotent. Any win he ekes out has an asterisk, and this is all Raimi showing how heroism is pain. Now Peter tries to hold off selling Jameson a Spidey photo until... Alright, run a picture of a rancid chicken. Here's a headline. Food poisoning scare sweeps city. Some food got poisoned? I'm a little nauseous, yeah. All right, Mr. Jameson. Yeah, Peter has to give in to stop fake news from sparking a citywide panic. It's also because he's broke, but you know, he tried here. The second asshole Columbia student to smack him is a cameo by Sam Raimi himself. And we meet Dr. Connors after his mention in the first film. Now, Kurt Connors is an amputee, and it was meant to set him up in a future film to try to regrow his arm and become the lizard. And yeah, over a year ago, some fans spotted how Peter has to duct tape his backpack strap to keep it all together. It's not exactly my mind-blowing though because as a high school student in 2004 this is just something we all try to do to look cool. It was the era of white out messages and whole duct tape prom suits. It's a weird time. Now Aunt May rubs in the guilt about Uncle Ben. Two years next month since he was taken. Oof taken passive voice not since that mugger shot him, but since he was taken from me by the universe and all the asshole bad Samaritans in it, was it you, Peter? Was it you? Peter's landlord is Mr. Dickovich. Rant. Rant. Raimi has always said Ditkovich's name was a nod to Spider-Man co-creator Steve Ditko. And in Peter's flat, the MJ photo behind him is not one of the photos he took of MJ on the field trip, as has been incorrectly stated, but it was actually a promo set photo of Kirsten Dunst from the first film. However, you can actually see one of the field trip photos later pinned to his mirror. The great Alfred Molina plays Dr. Otto Octavius, and Daniel Day Kim plays his assistant. Now Peter and Otto trade nerdy references. Did Bernoulli sleep before he found the curves of Quickest Descent? 
Actually, back in 04, my high school geometry teacher was obsessed with this line, and he explained how Peter is actually referencing the physics of his own swing. Bernoulli proposed that the fastest way to get from A to B could actually be a curved motion using the forces of gravity. And then a month ago, when I talked about Tom Holland, Peter applying classroom physics in Homecoming, some of you tweeted me a Reddit post saying, yeah, Toby did the same thing, but, but, but. As the comments of that post and my geometry teacher correctly explained, for Bernoulli's brachistochrone to apply, Peter's web length would have to change as he swings, which it usually doesn't. It's a taut radius of a circle. Yet, however, when I actually rewatch this movie slowly, later, Peter does use the elasticity of his web, its fluctuating length due to gravity, to slingshot the clock tower hand back at Otto. He ahas his mentor with the physics they previously geeked out over to punch his clock. Checkmate. Uh, really, to be honest, math was not my strong suit. I was more of a Rosie. And I was trying to explain the theory of relativity. Mm -hmm. And Rosie was trying to explain T.S. Eliot. T.S. Eliot famously ended his 1925 poem, The Hollow Men, with the line, This is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but with a whimper. And during the Cold War, this poem was considered eerily prophetic for its relevance to nuclear annihilation. Similar fusion tech that spells out Octavius's doom, which, thankfully for the city, comes not with a bang, but with a whimper. And speaking of AP Lit, MJ's play is Oscar Wilde's The Importance of Being Earnest, which is about a man living a double life. The name Earnest itself being a pun about his lack of earnestness. And you probably noticed how the dialogue obviously reflects Peter and MJ's situation. Then you think we should forgive them? Yes. I mean, no. I hope you have not been leading a double life, pretending to be wicked and being really good all the time. That would be hypocrisy. But if you've actually read this play, this insincerity theme doesn't stop with the guy. Every character in the play is full of it. And just like how this metaphor is really about MJ, whose attraction to Peter is really based on his mysterious unknowns. Mm, huge red flags? Not a deal breaker. Now, Peter's late after stopping to chase, he dangles the two criminals from the light pole right beside a chandelier store. Because, you know, they're hanging from the light like they're like chandeliers and you get it. Sam Raimi collaborator Bruce Campbell cameos again as the snooty usher. No one will be seated after the doors are closed. It helps maintain the illusion. Uh, Bruce played the wrestling announcer in the first film and the restaurant host in the third. Much speculation that he was being set up as wannabe actor Mysterio. It helps maintain the illusion. There was actually concept art drawn out for a scrapped fourth Raimi film that would have opened with Spider-Man booking Mysterio. Two years ago, fans spotted that you can see how Peter briefly considers webbing that usher. But the real detail behind this is that this movie's early script draft and novelization included Peter actually webbing up Bruce Campbell, but then only making it into the play for the final scene. So we still missed it. Outside, there's this violin busker playing the 60s Spider-Man theme. Spider-Man, a Spider-Man. Does whatever a spider can. And the show poster behind MJ raves, Jay Frazier is especially effective. A nod to John Frazier, who was part of the team who won an Oscar for their special effects work on the film. Peter shares an elevator with Hal Sparks. Phil Lamar actually auditioned for this cameo. He ended up doing an uncredited cameo on the train. Now, Melina nicknamed the Doc Ock arms Larry, Harry, Moe, and Flo. Flo was a top right one used for more delicate functions like handling the tritium and later removing the sunglasses, lighting a cigar. And at the base of this incredibly dangerous fusion reaction in the middle of a city is a pool of water. Now, this is used probably as a coolant for telling his future solution to the problem later. The river. Drown it. Everything goes wrong. The moment Octavius invokes Icarus. The power of the sun in the palm of my hand. <laughs> okay, now his hand loses its contents the second he tries to reassure everyone. Keep calm, it's only a spike. It'll soon stabilize. His watch zipping into the fusion. Now, because Peter distracts Otto, Otto fails to contain the biggest energy spike, the one that bends the windows and kills Rosie. Was it you, Peter? And I love Raimi's shot with Rosie reflecting on the glass right before it goes into her eye, echoed later with the reflection of Peter in Otto's eye as that threat zips towards him. Now, my second favorite scene in the movie is one Raimi took months to design, Doc Ock's awakening in the hospital. This is true Raimi horror. Evoking 
the tree branch drag in Evil Dead 2. Raimi even includes a close-up of Ash's iconic weapon, the chainsaw, and he mixes in a solid bone snap sound effect when the arm grabs the surgeon's leg. <laughs> One of the surgeons is a cameo by horror director John Landis. And one of my favorite details that I only caught by actually re-watching this again in slow motion, when the arms are docile under Otto's control, their claw lights are white. But when they are in control and evil, the lights go red. And we see this again later when he regains control of them in the final act. Hey, you may be able to relate with Peter Parker's frustrations in today's era with issues like the content you normally consume on the internet being blocked from your reach or hackers and scammers stealing your info. Well, ExpressVPN is your solution. Thanks to ExpressVPN for sponsoring this video. ExpressVPN is a virtual private network that encrypts your data to keep it from being stolen or tracked and can grant you access to blocked content. Many websites and services are blocked in different parts of the world and some countries censor websites and don't let you surf freely. Like Netflix in the UK has content US Netflix doesn't have and vice versa. There are countries that won't even let you use Netflix. Can you imagine? And some things are even more expensive online depending on where you live, like airline tickets. How could they do this to us. ExpressVPN allows you to reroute your connection to a server in a country of your choice, making geo restrictions a thing of the past. ExpressVPN is also helpful for preventing your online data from being stolen or monitored without your knowledge, which to me is the equivalent of throwing a freaking car at me through the window. ExpressVPN servers operate at the fastest speeds. They have 24-7 customer support and it's super easy to use. Just fire up the app and connect with just one click. It's a top rated VPN provider rated number one by TechRadar, CNET, and many more. Find out how you can get three months free by clicking the link in the description box below, expressvpn.com slash new rockstars. Again, that's expressvpn.com slash new rockstars. Dr. Octopus is coined by Jameson, well, actually by Hoffman, Ted Raimi, Sam's brother. And again, we gotta mention Dr. Strange was taken. Dr. Strange, that's pretty good, but it's taken. Meaning he exists in this film universe, which has proven more than a bit ironic now that Sam Raimi is directing Dr. Strange 2 for Marvel. And uh, pause in here so J.K. Simmons can make you smile. But could you pay me in advance? <laughs> Auto laments. And these monstrous things should be at the bottom of the river, along with me. And that little hiss from flow and gradual fade from white to red signals the arms take over from here forward. When they turn white again at the end, Otto will resume with this suicidal thinking, drowning himself and his little monsters in the bottom of the river. Joel McHale cameos as a loan officer. Oh, but I'm giving piano lessons again. You are? Ow. I love that she meant to kick Peter, but kicks Joel. But May's piano teaching might justify why Peter was so randomly good at piano in the third movie, if anything could justify that madness. Otto's climb up the wall has a rhythmic pacing to it. That's because during production, Melina was performing as Tevia in the revival of Fiddler on the Roof, and he would hum under his breath that stompy song, If I were a rich man. And the puppeteers would sync the arm walk with a song. <laughs> I played Fiatka. Stan Lee cameos pulling someone to safety. Then in the worst gig ever, Peter leaves the lens cap on. Oh, come on. And he keeps missing out on the last app or cocktail, a gag that the high society movie The Great Gatsby would later call back. MJ gets engaged to Jameson's astronaut son, John, who becomes Man-Wolf in the comics. And after his powers glitch out again, the Daily Bugle he reads includes a blurb about chronic back pain, maybe a nod to Tobey Maguire's back pain that almost caused him to sit out this movie, some believe that the later joke could have been a nod to that. My back. But the writers claim that this joke was already written in the script before Toby's issues came out. Peter dream chats with Uncle Ben's ghost. Under Peter's zip up, you can actually see he is wearing the red top of his wrestler costume. And Peter says, No more. And he junks his suit. With this frame pulled directly from the famous Amazing Spider Man issue 50, Spider Man No More, this title also shows up on a Daily Bugle front page. Now, Peter fixes the wheel of his moped that got crushed earlier in the film, but just like that wheel flies out the window, so do his hopes for normalcy. Now, the bugle blames him for rising crime, and he watches a guy get jumped. Originally in the script, this victim was gonna be the man who recovered and sold Jameson the suit, a more direct consequence of Peter's retirement. Now, as I pointed out, breakdown of the previous film, the guy who points Peter to the burning building is the same guy from the bridge. And again, despite this apparent victory, Peter still cannot win. Some poor soul got trapped on the fourth floor. All right, Billy, let's knock it.
But Peter finally gives into this heroism is pain idea. Inspired by Aunt May swallowing her pride and selling her house. You know, sometimes we have to be steady and and give up the thing we want the most. Now, it's pretty obvious that May knows Peter is Spider-Man, which I suspect is why she got the kid next door to help her pack up her house despite his baby arms. She's guilting Peter with a child's disappointment. He'll be back, right? I don't know. You got him! Otto gets Peter's attention by throwing a f***ing car at him. Just as the face of Rosie was reflected on the glass before her death, MJ's kissy face is reflected briefly on Peter's lenses seconds before her near death. These are the frames Peter literally detaches from, just as he lets go of his dreams of love with MJ, regaining his heroic vision both literally and metaphorically. This fist close-up was an image focused on by Alex Ross's opening art, bringing Peter full circle with the rediscovery of his power. The Bugle reports, he's back! But no photo on the front page, since they wouldn't have any recent photos of Spider-Man to use. Also, the blurb up in the corner reads, MTA insider concerned over aging L-Train safety, reflecting the safety concerns for the following L-Train sequence. Now, New York did not have an L in operation, so they shot all of this on Chicago's loop. This train fight is one of the best sequences in the superhero genre. Raimi breaks it all up into three acts, just like a short film that works on its own. Act one, Peter versus Otto on the clock tower, a ticking clock as metaphor. Act two, Peter versus Otto on the train, both victims of destiny together. And then in act three, Peter alone versus a train, man versus time and destiny itself. It opens with Peter's heroic swings into action with Raimi pulls out to reveal framed within the deadly threat waiting for him. The the sunglasses lens of Doc Ock. No cool moment without an asterisk of how he's about to die. I love this kind of shot. Robert Zemeckis actually used a similar tracking shot mirror reframe in contact. Very cool way of shifting subjective point of view to the target of the action. When they tumble down onto the train, Otto's arms cushion his body during the roll. Raimi also smartly cuts off into the passengers, including the classic woman with a baby. And briefly, Peter and Otto go inside the car so that a minute later when Otto starts playing 500 with people. This doesn't come out of nowhere. It happens after Peter's empathy has been triggered. Now this train stop gives us some epic Toby faces, which yes, the memes are hilarious. But without the ironic detachment that hijacked us as we got older, this is a beaten down hero, gripping onto the one thing he has left after having to let go of everything else he wants. All of this suffering has boiled over and now Toby is venting pure cathartic rage. It's earned and I love it. We get some good Christ pose imagery. And the kids who return his mask are cameos by Toby's half brothers. After Robbie the editor, May, these passengers, and then of course Harry and MJ, Peter's precious anonymity in this film is stripped away from him. One of the many things he has to let go of. Otto wraps Peter in barbed wire, echoing the moment Peter briefly saw a spider web strung up in a barbed wire coil in the first film. His whole webby world surrounded by a ring of death. Behind Harry's propped up knife is a framed photo with Norman. I assume this is Harry's revenge table. Peter ends up flipping Otto by repeating Aunt May's wisdom. Oh, sometimes, sometimes we, we to do what's right, have we have to, to be steady, steady and, and give, give up, up the thing, thing we, we want, want the most. most. Even, Even our dreams. dreams. And Peter can finally deliver this with sincere, honest heartbreak. Because in this moment, he is really talking about his dream with MJ. He truly gets the importance of being earnest. Now, along with John Jameson, I just realized that Jay Jonah and Hoffman arrive with the cops too. This guy cannot pass up an opportunity to insert himself in the story in order to sell more papers. Norman Osborn returns inside Harry's mind. Now, a little detail I spotted by going through this frame by frame. When he throws the dagger through the mirror, it briefly switches from Norman to his own reflection and then back to Norman who looks pained as the glass breaks. Two generations of Green Goblin becoming one in the same. And then after Harry finds the Goblin Cave, I think most of us got that green bow tie he shows up wearing at the wedding. It's okay if this was a bombshell for you. It's just kind of like baked in for me since I spent the whole summer of 04 re-watching this with like Prisoner of Azkaban. But I love this ending. It parallels the ending of The Graduate. A runaway bride fleeing the church to be with the scrappy dope. But The Graduate's ending is brilliant because it is not a fairy tale ending, it's a bitter sweet, hello darkness, bus ride where the young couple catches their breath and realizes, wait, crap, what did we just do? What now? MJ here makes the same realization. She teases fairy tale ending with her comic's pet name. Go get him, tiger. 
And for a second, we think it's gonna end with another golden sunset heroic swing past the stars and stripes, just like the first movie did. But nope, Raimi cuts back to MJ with dark tones and an ominous fade to black. It's a bittersweet graduate Hello Darkness ending, echoing the opening shot of MJ as the love that Peter would never have time for, reminding us that Spider-Man 2 is not a story about heroes win, but how heroism is pain, and every heroic victory is underscored by a dark consequence. As you can see, Spider-Man 2 was one of the all-time best superhero films, filled with awesome attention to detail that other recappers just gloss over because it's not the precious MCU. And I am so thrilled that you guys asked me a month ago to break down a movie that was such a big part of my youth. And if you were there with me in the summer of 2004, I hope this brought back some memories for you. Feel free to share those in the comments instead of, you know, like snarking that I missed some bullshit Ford Focus Easter egg someone pointed out to you without really understanding what an actual movie detail is. Join our future classic movie watch-alongs on Discord by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash newrockstars. Follow me on Instagram at EA Voss, follow New Rockstars, and subscribe for more in-depth movie breakdowns. Godspeed! Oh.